If you were to strip away the skin of modern civilization, peeling back the steel of our cars, the glass of our skyscrapers, and the plastic of our devices, you would find a nervous system made of silicon. It is the defining material of our age. In 2026, there is no such thing as a tech industry. There is only the world economy and every single sector of it, from agriculture to finance, from healthcare to warfare, runs on semiconductors. A modern internal combustion engine car contains over 1,000 chips. For the last century, geopolitics was defined by oil. Nations invaded each other, toppled governments, and drew arbitrary lines in the desert to secure the flow of black gold. But the new oil analogy is dangerously misleading. Oil is fungible and widely distributed. If a pipeline in the Middle East is bombed, you can buy oil from Texas, Norway, or Venezuela. It might cost more, but the supply exists. High-end semiconductors are different. They are not a commodity. They are a miracle of engineering that can effectively be produced in volume in only one place on Earth. That place is a small, subtropical island sitting on a seismic fault line, directly in the shadow of a superpower that claims to own it. That place is Taiwan, and specifically, it is a single company, TSMC, Taiwan's Semiconductor Manufacturing Company. To understand the precariousness of our existence, you have to look at the numbers. TSMC manufactures roughly 90% of the world's most advanced semiconductors, the chips smaller than 7 nanometers, that power artificial intelligence, 5G networks, and hypersonic missiles. If you look at the graphics processor inside an NVIDIA AI server or the A-series chip inside an Apple iPhone, it was almost certainly made in a clean room in Hsinchu or Tainan. This is not a monopoly. It is a single point of failure for the human species. If TSMC were to go offline tomorrow, whether due to an earthquake, a blockade, or an invasion, the global economy would not just recede, it would suffer a stroke. This concentration of power is not an accident. It is the result of a deliberate decades-long grand strategy known as the Silicon Shield. The Taiwanese government and industry leaders, led by the legendary Morris Chang, understood early on that their island's survival depended on making itself indispensable. They realized that they could not defeat the People's Liberation Army, PLA, with tanks or jets. Instead, they built a defense mechanism based on economic mutually assured destruction. By ensuring that the prosperity of the United States, Europe, and even China itself depended on the factories of Taiwan, they calculated that the world would have no choice but to protect them. They turned their economy into a geopolitical hostage, strapping the global supply chain to their chest as a form of insurance. The manufacturing process itself is the moat. Making an advanced chip is the most complex engineering feat in human history. It involves etching billions of transistors, each one thousands of times smaller than a red blood cell, onto a wafer of silicon using extreme ultraviolet EUV light. These machines, made by the Dutch company ASML, are the size of a bus, cost $300 million each and are so precise that they could hit a golf ball on the moon. TSMC has mastered this alchemy in a way that no American or European company can replicate. Intel, the former king of silicon, fell behind because it focused on quarterly profits, while TSMC focused on relentless, capital-intensive engineering. The result is that the arsenal of democracy now relies on a foreign entity for its most critical ammunition. But the silicon shield is cracking. What was meant to be a deterrent has become a target. For the Chinese Communist Party, Taiwan is not just a rogue province. It is the final piece of the puzzle for national rejuvenation and global dominance. Beijing knows that whoever controls the fabs in Taiwan controls the future of AI and military technology. If China were to seize TSMC intact, they would instantly become the technological hegemon of the 21st century. Conversely, if the US fears that capture is imminent, there are credible reports that the scorched earth policy is the fallback plan bombing the factories to prevent them from falling into Chinese hands. Imagine the scenario. The Chinese Navy surrounds the island in a quarantine, blocking the import of chemicals and gases needed to run the fabs. The factories shut down within days. The impact would be immediate and catastrophic. The production of smartphones would stop. Next, the auto industry would freeze. Then, the cloud computing giants, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, would find themselves unable to replace servers. The estimated cost of a disruption to the Taiwanese semiconductor industry is over $2 trillion in the first year alone. It would make the COVID-19 supply chain crisis look like a minor hiccup. It would be a global depression overnight. This puts the world in a hostage situation. The United States cannot afford to lose Taiwan, yet it cannot guarantee its defense without risking World War III. China cannot afford to destroy Taiwan's economy, which it relies on for its own tech sector, yet it cannot accept the status quo indefinitely. The entire global order is balanced on a razor's edge, centered on a few industrial parks in East Asia. We are living in a period of peak centralization, where the efficiency of the market has created a fragility that is now being exploited by the realities of war. 
To understand how the United States voluntarily surrendered the, kim- the keys to the kingdom of the 21st century, we must go back to a time when Silicon Valley actually lived up to its name. In the 1980s, the Valley was not just a place where code was written, it was a place where things were made. Companies like Intel, National Semiconductor and Advanced Micro Devices, AMD, were integrated device manufacturers, IDMs. They did it all. They designed the chips, they built the factories, fabs, and they manufactured the silicon. The prevailing ethos of the era was best captured by Jerry Sanders, the flamboyant founder of AMD. When asked why he insisted on building his own factories despite the immense cost, he famously quipped, real men have fabs. It was a statement of industrial machismo, but it was also a statement of strategic necessity. In that era, the design of a chip and the manufacturing process were inextricably linked. You couldn't design a Ferrari engine if you didn't know exactly how the lathe worked. The United States dominated this world. It produced the vast majority of the world's silicon, and the idea that this critical capability would ever leave American shores seemed laughable. But in the 1990s, a new economic seduction began to take hold. It was driven not by engineers, but by Wall Street. The financial markets began to notice a discrepancy. Manufacturing chips was messy, dangerous, and incredibly expensive. Building a new fab cost billions of dollars. If you built the wrong factory for the wrong chip, you could bankrupt the company. It was a business of high capital expenditure, capex, and shrinking margins. On the other hand, designing chips was pure intellectual property. It required office parks, not chemical plants. It scaled infinitely with zero marginal cost. Wall Street loved asset light businesses. They loved software margins. And so, the pressure mounted on American CEOs to shed their heavy assets and focus on the value add of design. This birthed the fabless revolution. New companies like Qualcomm, Broadcom, and NVIDIA emerged with a radical business model. They would design the most advanced chips in the world, but they would not manufacture a single one. They would outsource the dirty work to contract manufacturers. At the time, this was hailed as a stroke of capitalist genius. It allowed American companies to grow massive valuations without the anchor of heavy industry. But who would build the chips? Enter Morris Cheng, a Texas Instruments veteran who had been passed over for the top job, Chong moved to Taiwan and founded TSMC in 1987 with a revolutionary, almost heretical idea, the Pure Play Foundry. TSMC would design nothing. They would not compete with their customers. They would simply be the world's printer. If you sent them a digital file, they would send you back a silicon wafer. For decades, American executives viewed TSMC not as a rival, but as a utility, a lowly service provider that handled the grunt work while the Americans kept the genius and the profit. They didn't realize that by outsourcing the manufacturing, they were outsourcing the learning. In semiconductor manufacturing, you learn by doing. Every wafer you run teaches you something about the physics of the process. By handling the volume for everyone, NVIDIA, Qualcomm, AMD, TSMC began to learn faster than anyone else. They were iterating on the collective knowledge of the entire global chip industry, while Intel was only learning from its own chips. The fatal turning point, the moment the balance of power decisively shifted, occurred in 2005. It is a story that should be taught in every business school as a lesson in the dangers of short-term thinking. Steve Jobs approached Paul Ottolini, the CEO of Intel, with a secret project. Apple was building a revolutionary new device, a phone that was really a computer. They needed a processor that was powerful but consumed almost no battery power. Jobs offered the contract to Intel. Ottolini crunched the numbers. He looked at the price Apple was willing to pay, and he looked at the volume forecasts. He concluded that the iPhone would be a niche product. The margins were too thin. It wasn't worth retooling Intel's massive high margin factories to make cheap phone chips. Intel said no. Jobs went to Samsung and eventually Apple moved its production to TSMC. The iPhone, of course, became the most successful product in history. It drove a massive explosion in mobile computing. TSMC rode that wave. The insatiable demand for iPhone chips gave TSMC the hundreds of billions of dollars in revenue it needed to invest in the next generation of technology. Extreme ultraviolet EUV lithography. This was the moonshot technology required to make chips smaller than seven nanometers. It was so expensive and difficult that Intel hesitated to adopt it. TSMC, flush with Apple's cash, went all in. By 2018, the trap had snapped shut. TSMC had mastered EUV, Intel had not. For the first time in history, the American giant was not just behind, it was lapped. Intel's own manufacturing process stalled, while TSMC began churning out 5 nanometer chips for Apple and AMD. The result is the hollowing out of American technological sovereignty. Today, the most valuable chip company in America, NVIDIA, is worth trillions. But NVIDIA cannot make its own chips. 
Its CEO, Jensen Huang, is a genius of design, but he is fundamentally a client of TSMC. If TSMC stops shipping, NVIDIA's revenue goes to zero overnight. The same is true for Apple. The M-series chips that make MacBooks so fast, made in Taiwan. The same is true for the US military. The F-35 fighter jet, the backbone of NATO air superiority, relies on chips made by TSMC. We have created a bizarre paradox. The United States leads the world in chip design. We have the best software, the best architects, and the most valuable intellectual property. But we have completely lost the physical means of production. We are like an author who has written the greatest novel in history but has forgotten how to operate a printing press. Wall Street got what it wanted. The fabless companies are incredibly profitable. They have high margins and low overhead. But national security is not about profit margins. It is about supply chain security. By chasing the easy money of design and financialization, the West allowed the manufacturing center of gravity to shift to the most geologically and geopolitically unstable piece of real estate on the planet. We traded our industrial resilience for higher stock prices. And now, as the warships gather in the Taiwan Strait, the bill for that trade is coming due. The faiblesse model works perfectly in a world of peace and free trade. In a world of conflict, it is a suicide pact. We have established that the world has placed all its technological eggs in one very fragile basket. But what happens if that basket is dropped? Or, more likely, what happens if the People's Republic of China simply puts a lock on it? Wargaming experts and Pentagon strategists often fixate on a D-Day-style amphibious invasion of Taiwan, thousands of PLA Marines storming the beaches. But, in reality, Beijing does not need to invade Taiwan to bring the West to its knees. They only need to implement a quarantine. This is the gray zone scenario that keeps Western leaders awake at night. Instead of firing missiles, China could simply declare a maritime exclusion zone around the island, ostensibly for customs inspections. They wouldn't need to sink ships. They would just need to stop the tankers carrying the specialized chemicals, photoresists, and industrial gases that TSMC needs to operate. A semiconductor fab is a voracious beast. It consumes massive amounts of these materials daily. Without them, the clean room stopped functioning within 48 to 96 hours. The economic shockwave of such a blockade would be unlike anything in human history. According to estimates by the Rhodium Group and other think tanks, a disruption of the Taiwanese semiconductor industry would cost the global economy over $2.5 trillion in the first year alone. Other estimates put the total fallout at $10 trillion, roughly 10% of global GDP. To put that in perspective, the 2008 financial crisis caused a global GDP contraction of roughly 1%. This would not be a recession, it would be a global depression. The auto industry would collapse first. Without microcontrollers for brakes and engines, assembly lines from Detroit to Wolfsburg would halt. Next, the cloud would go dark. Data centers replace roughly 30% of their servers every year. If Amazon, Google, and Microsoft cannot get new chips, the internet itself begins to degrade. Then comes the medical crisis. Modern MRI machines, ventilators, and pacemakers all run on chips that are overwhelmingly made in Taiwan. But the most terrifying impact is on the US military itself. It is an open secret in the defense community that the arsenal of democracy runs on Taiwanese silicon. The F-35 Lightning II, the most advanced fighter jet in history, relies on chips manufactured by TSMC. The Javelin anti-tank missiles that decimated Russian tanks in Ukraine, they run on older legacy chips that are also largely sourced from Taiwan. In a supreme irony, the US military has found itself in a position where it might not be able to build the weapons it needs to defend the very island that produces the chips for those weapons. This dependency has led to hushed discussions in Washington about the scorched earth strategy. Former US officials have publicly speculated that if an invasion were imminent, the United States might have no choice but to bomb the TSMC facilities ourselves. The logic is brutal. If we can't have them, China certainly can't. This theory, sometimes called the broken nest strategy, suggests that turning the fabs into rubble would remove the prize, making the island less valuable to Beijing. But for Taiwan, this is not a reassurance. It is a threat. It implies that their greatest shield is also a target on their back. So why hasn't the US fixed this? Why haven't we just built the factories at home? This brings us to the tragedy of TSMC Arizona. In a desperate bid to reshore manufacturing, the US government passed the CHIPS Act, offering $52 billion in subsidies to companies like TSMC to build fabs in the American desert. TSMC agreed, but the project has turned into a slow motion disaster. The first factory in Phoenix is already years behind schedule. Why? It isn't the technology, it is the culture. TSMC operates on a grueling military-style work ethic. Engineers in Taiwan are on call 24-7. If a machine breaks at 2 a.m., they are in the fab by 2.30 a.m. 
When TSMC tried to import this culture to Arizona, American workers revolted. They refused the long hours and the rigid hierarchy. In return, TSMC's founder Morris Chang has been caught on tape calling the American effort naive and lamenting the lack of manufacturing talent in the U.S. Furthermore, the cost of building in the U.S. is at least 40% higher than in Taiwan. The CHIPS Act subsidies are a drop in the bucket compared to the trillions of dollars of ecosystem advantages that Taiwan has built over 40 years. We are finding out the hard way that you cannot simply buy a supply chain. You have to grow it, and we stopped watering ours 30 years ago. The conclusion is inescapable. We are trapped. For the foreseeable future, at least the next five to 10 years, the global economy will remain hostage to the stability of the Taiwan Strait. The silicon shield is holding, but it is under immense strain. China is watching the U.S. struggle in Arizona, and they are calculating their odds. They know that time is on their side. They know that every day the U.S. relies on Taiwan is a day where Beijing holds a knife to the throat of the global economy. The centralization of risk mirrors another historical vulnerability. Just as we have centralized our digital wealth in a single island, we have centralized our financial wealth in a single currency and a banking system that is increasingly fragile. Governments, when cornered by existential threats, do not respect property rights. They do not respect boundaries. If the chips stop flowing and the economy collapses, the state will take whatever measures are necessary to survive. In 1933, faced with a different kind of economic collapse, the U.S. government decided that the private wealth of its citizens was a public resource to be harvested. They didn't ask for your gold. They demanded it. Franklin D. Roosevelt signed Executive Order 6102. 